Well, we've got uh, Russ Quinn is going to preach for us tonight. He is going to be with us through the 29th, which is the night we will have Starlight Spectacular. And I know that you'll uh, want to tell him right now how much you appreciate and love him. What a great job he's done. Amen. Great, great guy. I saw Laura. Where, where's Laura? There, right over here. Okay. Laura and all the Quinn girls, five of them. And uh, Russ, I know you're going to miss them because they're staying here. But uh, no, they're not. They're going with you, and uh, they're sweet girls. Now, Hannah's staying, though. You're going to the University of Memphis, right? And we're excited about that, and we will take good care of her, all right? But uh, Russ and I have been uh, friends. He came on staff with us. When he graduated from Union, I had already met him while he was a student at Union, and I was at West Jackson Baptist Church, and that's where I was uh, Amy's pastor as well. But uh, at any rate, uh, we met, and he came to seminary. Uh, Sanford University has a divinity school called Beeson Divinity School, a seminary there, and so he came there, and uh, he was good friends with David Jett, who was on staff with me, and he came on staff with us and did a great job. Served with us 10 years. I think you were with Kevin up at uh, Louisville for about four or five years, right? You've been here seven years, is that right? So the last uh, 21, 22, whatever years, uh, I've been closely associated with him. And uh, he's just become like my brother, my little brother. And uh, I love him and appreciate him so much. But he's going to be the bishop. I want you to write this down and be praying for this church, okay? Did I say bishop? Okay. I've been calling this, it's the funny, I've been calling the Bishop of Enon, all right? Uh, anyway, uh, I had a, a friend that was pastor at First Baptist, Venus, Texas. I said, you're the Bishop of Venus. But anyway, um, uh, he is going to be the pastor, excuse me, uh, same thing in the New Testament. But anyway, he's going to be the pastor of the uh, Enon, E-N-O-N, Baptist Church in Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, Alabama. And I hope that you'll be praying for them. Great church. Uh, when, when I was there, and he'll probably tell you a little bit more about it, they were running probably about 200, 250, and now they're pushing 700. They've just about tripled in the last few years, and it's in a great location. Don and I lived about five miles south of that church, and just a great place, a lot of growth, and God has strategically put him there for such a time as this. So I love him. He's, I asked him, I said, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be here, but I know the people get tired of hearing me. Why don't you come up and preach the Word, and they can hear a real sermon. And so he said he'd be glad to do it. So let's welcome uh, Russ Quinn tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And before we get started, let me just uh, tell you, Bellevue Baptist Church, that my family loves you so much. Thank you so much for uh, seven great years. You know, we uh, came to Bellevue Baptist Church seven years ago uh, during Vacation Bible School Week, and uh, it's been an amazing seven years for us. We have uh, baptized two of my children here, uh, Ellen and Abigail, and we praise God for that. Uh, we even added a baby in the last seven years, Mary. Uh, was born here in Memphis. We had three babies in Alabama, and then we had one in Kentucky, and then we had one here in Tennessee, and we're going back to Alabama, but we have no plans of any more Alabama babies, all right? So just, just for the record. But, um, man, it's been great. We, we love you. Uh, the Lord has rooted us here. And uh, let me just tell you, it's been a struggle coming to this point of decision for us. Uh, we, we, we don't want to go. We love Bellevue. We love the people here. I love Steve. Steve is like a big brother to me. I'm so grateful to him and how he took me in as a college student and poured so much into me, taught me how to preach. I've, everything I know good about being a pastor or preaching, I've learned from him. Any mistakes are my own. But, uh, but he's been so good to me. And I've loved serving with, uh, with, with David Coombs and Drew Tucker and Mark Blair and, and all kinds of other friends on staff. This is a great staff. I've so enjoyed the, uh, serving with the deacons and the leadership here. One of the things about Bellevue, you're so blessed with leaders. 
Uh, it's amazing how many leaders and the quality of leaders uh, are at Bellevue Baptist Church. I love the past of this church. been honored to be on this stage and this pulpit following the preachers uh, that have pastored this church. And uh, I love the present of this church. Let me just tell you, we've had uh, two or three consultants that are national consultants come in and, 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 and meet with our people and meet with Bellevue over the last few years that I've been here. And I want you to know that every one of them say this consistently, that Bellevue Baptist Church is one of the kindest churches in the country. And, uh, you know, I love that. And, and you are. This, is, this church, uh, intentional hospitality was exactly the right description when we came up with that, when you want to describe Bellevue Baptist Church. This is the kindest church I think I've ever been in, and, uh, and we love you, and we're glad. But I tell you, the hardest part for me has been coming to the point of really realizing that I wouldn't have a role in what I see to be the vision of the future of this church. Because I really believe in the vision that God has given us over the last few years. As we've rolled out this vision frame, I really believe with all my heart that God wants to raise this church up to be a catalyst of spiritual awakening in Memphis and beyond. I think God has marked this church out. I think that it's in a, this is a special church in a special place at a special time. And you don't know anybody that has more confidence in the stock of Bellevue Baptist Church than me. And so it's hard for us to leave. It really is. Man, this has been a, a hard journey over the last couple of months. And, uh, but God has made it so clear that this is His will for me, this is His will for my family. He's made it clear to me, He's made it clear to Laura, He's made it clear to those around us. And uh, at this point, it's so clear that I would be afraid not to obey Him. And so uh, we're excited. I'm excited to get to preach every week. Uh, but there's, you know, it's a mixed emotion. It really is. We, we, we go through the, the cycle of emotions about every 15 minutes right now. And especially when I start thinking about leaving my baby. Uh, at the University of Memphis. <laughs> and, uh, but Hannah feels called to stay here. She's uh, got deep roots here. You know, they've grown up here. And, uh, and she wants to stay involved in leading in, in, in the groups that she's leading in. And, and she loves Bellevue, loves Memphis, and, and really feels called to stay at Bellevue and in Memphis. But I'm so glad to have the, the opportunity to preach tonight. You know, I love to preach. Now, living with six women, let me just tell you, uh, really when I preach is the only time I get to get a word in edgewise. So uh, I love to preach, all right? And, uh, and I'm looking forward to preach. I love God's Word, though. Let me just tell you, God's Word has changed my life. And uh, I believe it can change your life. I believe that God's Word is the most powerful force in the universe. And I love to preach God's Word. I love to learn God's Word better. I love to make God's Word clear. And I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to preach uh, on a regular basis. But let me ask you a question tonight. I want to share with you a message entitled, Are You Qualified? And I want to ask you the question, are you qualified? You know, all of us struggle with the fear of not being qualified. We've all faced that fear, and we all face a fear of experiencing rejection. You know, so oftentimes we see something we want in life, and we just wonder, do we measure up? Can we attain to it? Can we get it? Are we qualified for what we want? What if what, if what we want is out of our league. Now, we've just gone through the process. God willing, we're going to close on a house uh, in Alabama on uh, June the 30th. And so we've been these last few days. I'm, I'm going to Nicaragua in the morning with our student group, 50 students. We're going to Hinatega, Nicaragua for a week. So I was trying to, uh, the last uh, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, trying to get every, all the ducks in a row to get all the financing in place so that I, I could, we could close on this house. So I've been all about mortgages. And what's the key word when you're trying to buy a house? Do you qualify? <laughs> you know, Are you qualified? You've got to prove that you're qualified to be able uh, to buy a house. And you know, it's the same thing when it comes to uh, college. We've had Hannah going to uh, looking at scholarships as a senior in high school and, and trying to uh, get into colleges. And, and she's had to list her qualifications time and time again. And you know, there's a fear in that. Am I qualified? Will I get in? Or will I be rejected? You know, oftentimes in relationships, Man, that's where there's a lot of fear of rejection. I can tell you, I was a student at, at Union University, and uh, the first time I saw Laura Quinn, Click then, Laura Click, I thought, oh my, <laughs> man, she's pretty. I want to go out with her. And uh, I wanted to ask her out, but you know what? I thought, surely she's out of my league, man. She's out of my league. Am I qualified for her to go out with me? And, and God uh, bless me. 
with that. And, and I'm still not sure I'm qualified, but she uh, went out with me anyway. And I'm grateful for that. Or a job. You go for a job interview. You know, I know for me, I just went down to a church and, 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 uh, and their question of me all weekend was, are you qualified to be our pastor? And, you know, I wasn't sure if they would think I was or not. And, uh, and you know, and I still wonder, am I qualified to be a pastor? So qualification is a part of every part of life. And, but what about being qualified spiritually? Are you qualified spiritually. You know, I just believe that most Christians are living lives less than what God wants for them because they don't believe they're qualified to do all that God wants them to do. I believe most Christians aren't living the lives that God wants for them because they don't believe they're qualified to do all that God wants them to do. And I love John chapter 4, and and there's John chapter 4 more than any other story in the Bible. The story of the Samaritan woman at the well has probably shaped my imagination, captured my imagination, shaped my ministry, and who I am as a person probably more than any other chapter in the whole Bible. And there's three things that we can learn from Jesus and this encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well about how Jesus qualifies us. And I believe there's three things that Jesus qualifies us to do based on this passage of Scripture in John chapter 4. First of all, you are qualified to receive Jesus. You are qualified to receive Jesus. Now, you know, one of the things that, that, that I think that the author of the Gospel of John is doing is with this story of the Samaritan woman, woman is I believe that he is wanting you to contrast this woman and who she is and how Jesus deals with her with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and who he is and how Jesus deals with him. I think it's pretty clear how the Bible does, how the the author does there, that we're supposed to contrast these two people. And there's a, a stark contrast between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. You'll remember in John chapter 3, When Nicodemus comes to Jesus, we learn three things in the first verse there. First of all, we learn his name. His name is Nicodemus. And we'll see in a minute, that's a big deal. His name meant something. Everybody knew who Nicodemus was. He had standing in the community. The other thing we know is is that he was a Pharisee. And what that tells us was is, is that Nicodemus was part of the conservative group of the day. He believed the Bible. He believed all the Bible. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two political, religious factions. There was no separation of church and state in Israel, and so religion and politics went hand in hand. And the Pharisees were the party of the people. They were the ones that believed all the Bible. And the Sadducees were a little bit more liberal. They just believed the first five books of the Bible. They were all about the temple. And they were more elite. But Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was the party of the people. And he was the conservative. And then we also learn in John chapter 3 about Nicodemus. He's called a ruler of the Jews. A ruler of the Jews. And what that means is, most likely, he was a member of what was known as the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, and they were a council, and they were the governing body of Israel. They were the supreme court, so to speak. And so he was a a known man, he was a Pharisee, and he was part of the Sanhedrin. He was a big deal. You might say that Nicodemus was one of the least needy, most qualified people in all of Israel. Now, who would you think Jesus would come and want to see if Jesus was coming to town? Now, today, we might think, well, if Jesus came to America, he would probably pick out one of our uh, great pastors. Perhaps he'd want to see somebody on the, on the stature of a Dr. Billy Graham or a Dr. Steve Gaines or a Dr. Adrian Rogers or someone like that. Well, when you think of those names, that's who you ought to associate with Nicodemus. He's qualified. He's the most qualified. And yet, Jesus asked him, he says to Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? See, even the most qualified person needed to be saved. They needed to be born again. And that was Jesus' message to Nicodemus. Now, if you go to chapter 4 and you look at the woman of the well, you'll notice that she is, is nothing like Nicodemus. First of all, We don't know her name. I think that's significant. 
We don't know her name. You know what? Nobody really paid much attention to her. She was not a big deal. Nobody would have recognized her name then, and nobody would really remember her name now. She was that kind of person. Nobody really knew who she was. But we do know that she was a Samaritan. That's a strike against her in ancient Israel. Did you know that Samaria is mentioned six times in these first five verses of the introduction of this story? Listen to what John chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 says. It says, And he had to pass, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was setting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Do you get the picture? (laughs) It's a big deal that Jesus is talking to this person because, number one, she's a Samaritan. Now, if you know much about Bible history, you'll know that there's a lot of racial tension between the Jews and the, and the, uh, and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were really kind of half-breed uh, uh, folks who had descended from the northern ten tribes that Assyria had conquered and, and, and had, had intermarried with them. And so they were generations removed from the nation of Israel. All the people in Jerusalem and Judea, the Jews, would have been those people who went to Babylon and then came back, and they still knew who their family was. They were pure in their eyes. And so Jewish people didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. And this woman is surprised even that, she's, that Jesus is talking to her because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The third strike against her is that she's a woman. She's a woman. Now, we don't understand that this today. We live in a post-feminist uh, generation. We live in a time of strong women. I'm not a feminist, but I'm just going to tell you I'm for strong women. I've got, I've got six daughters. I've been teaching them how to punch and how to shoot since they were little, man. I, look, I want my girls to be strong. I want them to be smart. I want, I want, I want if a guy is interested in them, I want him to be much of a man to be able to get their attention. All right? I, I believe in strong women. And, uh, but we, you know, that hasn't been how most of history has been. That has, it's not really how most of the world is. In most cultures and in most times, women have, have, been, have definitely been second class. And that was the case in that time. And this woman is a Samaritan, but she's a woman. An ancient Jewish prayer uh, literally said this. There was a prayer of thanksgiving where ancient Jewish people would say, Lord, thank you that I'm not a Gentile. Thank you that I'm not a slave. And thank you that I'm not a woman. That was the pecking order. And so this Samaritan woman has all these strikes against her. But you know what? She's not only uh, not qualified because she's a Samaritan and because she's a woman, she's rejected by even the other Samaritan women. This lady is rejected socially. The text is very clear there that it is about the sixth hour. Now, some uh, translators might translate that and say that that's 6 p.m. I don't believe that's true. I think most scholars agree uh, that the sixth hour was probably uh, noon time. And so she is there in the heat of the day. Now, how many of you guys go and do your hard work outside in the heat of the day? Anybody want to mow your, your yard at noon? I don't think so. We want to wait to the cool of the day. And that's exactly when most people that had any sense went to get water. That's what they did. That was the work of the day. And, and women did that, and they would go get water. This woman's coming at noon. You know why? Because we'll find out in a minute her history and her past had made her a, re- a person who was rejected by even the other Samaritan women. So do you get the picture? Nicodemus is the most qualified, least needy person in Israel. This Samaritan woman, who we don't even know her name, represents the least qualified most needy person in all of Israel. So how does Jesus treat the least qualified person? That's what gets my attention. And that's what I love about this story. Let's look at, at how, what he has to say to her. John chapter 4 verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God 
and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What does Jesus offer to the, to the least qualified, most needy person? He offers the gift of God. That's what he does. And notice that she misunderstands him at first. She says in verses 11 and 12, she says, well, the well's deep. She thinks he's actually talking about physical water, uh, as you know, you'd expect somebody to. Uh, talks about Jacob. But then look at John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. You know, she still doesn't quite get it. Verse 15, she still doesn't really understand what he's saying about. But then Jesus drills down to her real issue. He lovingly exposes not just her social rejection, but her personal rejection. And he lovingly, like a good surgeon, gets in there and just kindly pricks the wound that's got her wounded in her heart. In verse 16, he tells her, he goes and he asks her a leading question. And how do many of you know that a lot of times Jesus can ask you a question that he already knows the answer to? Amen? And so he asks her, he says, go and call your husband. Go and call your husband. And she responds and says, well, you know, I have no husband. And Jesus knows that. And he says, you have spoken correctly. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. See, this woman, uh, her life had fallen apart. She was not only rejected socially, she had been rejected personally. Now, it might be easy for us to judge her and say, Ah, oh, look, she probably was the one that was wrong. Don't be so quick to do that. You never know what's going on in somebody else's life. You know, I'm sure she wasn't innocent, but I'll tell you what, she was probably sinned against as much as she had sinned. In that culture, uh, the, the men could divorce their wife for anything. Just like today, we have no-fault divorce today, and I think that's a terrible thing. But in that culture, men could divorce their wives for, uh, uh, for nothing, for just burning the toast or whatever. And, uh, and, they, and wives didn't get half. They didn't get anything. Property stayed with the husband. So she could have been married at a young age, divorced at a young age for no fault of her own, and then passed around until finally she just gave up on it. And now she's living with a man, and she's living in immorality, and she's shunned, and she's rejected. And she does not have uh, any kind of connection to anybody. This woman had met men who had looked with lust on her body. But now she was meeting a man who was looking at her soul and offering to satisfy her deepest need. Jesus saw everything about her. He saw her sin. He saw her problems. She had nowhere to hide. She was totally exposed. She had been ignored most of her life. She really didn't matter to most people, now someone who knew everything about her was not only talking to her, but was offering to give her the gift of God. Now, you know, I talk to a lot of people about their relationship with the Lord. And one of the things I often hear is I hear some people will say, well, you know what, uh, preacher, I, I want to I come to Jesus. I intend to come to Jesus one day. But before I do, there's some things I need to get right. There's some things I need to fix. I've got to fix some things before I come to Jesus. And I appreciate part of that. You know, if you're not willing to change, if you're not willing for Jesus to change your life, if you love sin more than you love Jesus, and you, and you want to hold on to your sin, you probably aren't going to come to Jesus. You know, you've got to come to Jesus with an open hand, willing and letting Him change. But let me just encourage you on this. Jesus saw everything about this woman, and He offered her the gift of God. Jesus sees everything about you, and He offers you the gift of God. There's nothing you can do to get ready to make yourself more ready to receive Jesus. People that tell me that, I often uh, just ask them this question. Well, why do you take a shower? <laughs> they say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, what if you came to my house... And I was putting stuff in my hair, man, getting it all pretty. And I was putting on deodorant. I was, you know, putting on cologne and just doing all that kind of stuff. And you say, well, Russ, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm cl get cleaning up. I'm getting ready to take a shower. Do you clean up to take a shower? Or do you take a shower to clean up? Listen, you don't clean up to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus to clean up. <laughs> 
Get it in the right order. And you really can't hide from Jesus. He knows everything about you. Listen, He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He knows what we've done. He knows why we did it. He knows what we haven't done. He knows everything about us. He knows everything you think. He knows everything you feel. Listen, He counts the number of hairs on your head on a consistent basis. Now, it's not as big a count for some of us as it is for others, but it just shows you how much attention He pays to each one of us. He knows you better than you know yourself. And you know what? He loves you. And you can't run from Him. You can't hide. But He's going to offer you the gift of God, which is living water. It represents salvation. And so you're qualified. You can receive Him today. He loves you in spite of yourself. He wants to give you and satisfy your deepest thirst. You can receive Him today. Would you like to receive Jesus? Listen, we're going to give you an opportunity here in just a few minutes. And you can respond and you can come and receive Jesus today. You're qualified. You are qualified. You might have heard a preacher say one time, well, only the elect can be saved. Well, listen, you say, well, I'm not sure I'm elect. If you want to come to Jesus, you're elect. You come on, you're qualified. All right? You might have heard other preachers that would say, well, it's all your, all your choice. And you say, well, you know, I've never been able to choose and make the right choice. And I don't know if I've got enough willpower to come to Jesus. I don't know if I've got enough faith to come to Jesus. Don't, look, you come with weak faith. Salvation is not about your willpower. Salvation is about trusting Jesus. You take one step to Him, He'll run to you. Let Jesus give you faith. You come as you are and receive Him. You are qualified to receive Jesus tonight. But you're not just qualified to receive Jesus. Let's go just a little deeper. You're also qualified to worship Jesus. You are qualified to worship Jesus. Now let's look at what else Jesus shares with this Samaritan woman. He offers to satisfy this needy woman's thirst, but he does much more than that. After Jesus points out her sin problem, the Samaritan woman reacts like most people She tries to change the subject a little bit. Look at what uh, she says in John chapter 4, verse 19. Now remember, he just pointed out that she's had five husbands, kind of uncomfortable, or as my uh, youngest daughter Mary would say, awkward, (laughs) you know. That was kind of an uncomfortable moment. And, And what does she do? The woman said to him in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, duh, (laughs) right? I mean, that doesn't take a whole lot. She does not have the gift of discernment to figure that out. He just told her everything about her. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She tries to change the subject next by introducing her own controversial theological question. This is a tactic. Man, you start sharing Jesus with people, this is what everybody under conviction will try to do. Change the subject. Introduce some kind of question that you can't answer. Everybody is trying to ask a question that that they think nobody can answer to stay away from Jesus. And she brings up one of the main issues that divided Jews and Samaritans. Where is the right place for worship? Where is the right place for worship? Look at verse 20. She says, Our Father is worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, you, you know, you got to know your Bible a little bit, but there's, they're, they're at the, at, right at the base of Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And Mount Gerizim was the place where, uh, where Israel, uh, Jeroboam and all the kings of Israel established a temple to worship that God didn't say to build. God said Jerusalem, the temples in Jerusalem, they built a false temple, they had false worship, it was an, a, a matter of contention, and it was a pretty sore subject for Samaritans because just a, about 150, 180 years before Jesus was born, uh, one of the kings of Israel, John Hyrcanus, came and destroyed that temple. So, I mean, there's a lot of political tension, a lot of theological tension in this question. I mean, it, people had died over this question. And so, you know, highly contentious uh, deal. Now, how does Jesus answer it? You know what? Jesus has a brilliant way of upholding the truth of God's Word and taking it to a whole nother level. Look at what Jesus says in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in the Jerusalem will you worship the Father. 
You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now look, he is totally staying with the truth of the Bible. As scandalous as it might be, we've got to stay with the truth of the Bible. And God told Abraham, Abraham, through your seed, I'm going to bless the nations. And then he told David, David, you're always going to have a son on the throne. And then he built the temple through Solomon. And God promised that he was going to bring the Messiah through the Jewish people. And so Jesus says, look, you know, it's not that the Jews are right and the Samaritans are wrong. It's that God's word is right (laughs) and everybody's wrong, (laughs) you know. And so he is standing on the truth of God's word. He says salvation is from the Jews. And then look at what he says next. He just goes to a whole nother plane in verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. And then I think verse 24 is probably the most profound verse when it comes to what the definition of true worship is in the entire Bible. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I love this. This is one of the things that has captured my imagination about Jesus. I love it that Jesus picks the most needy, least qualified person, the social reject of all of Israel, to reveal the most important verse about worship in the whole Bible. I love that about him. (laughs) I think that's amazing. I think that's awesome. And what he's teaching us here is that worship is not about our place. True worship is about his presence. That's what he's teaching the woman. He's saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what mountain you're on. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. It doesn't matter if you're at First Baptist Church or Second Baptist Church. It doesn't matter about our place. What matters is His presence. God is spirit, and we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's how we respond to the presence of God. It's how we respond to the truth of God. That's what makes worship true worship. And you know, a lot of churches get this wrong. You know, Jesus says we need to worship in spirit and truth. And for some reason, Christians, ever since he said that, want to take those two things and separate them. You know, you get some churches that are really into truth. I mean, they love the Bible. They love God's Word. But man, you start talking about the presence of God and they are are dead as a hammer, you know. Then you get other churches that, man, you know, they're happy, they're emotional, it's amazing, all that kind of stuff. But really, they don't care anything about submitting to the authority of the Word of God. You know, you get whole churches that are are either or. They're either spirit churches or they're truth churches. I think sometimes it's got to do with our personality. You know, you, you might have some people who are kind of truth people, you know. They like the truth. They're analytical. And they like to, to have reasons for everything. And they love truth, but man, they don't want any of the emotion, you know. And you get other people who are a little more emotional. And man, they want to feel good all the time. And they want to, everything's fun and everything's good. And they're all about the Spirit. But man, don't, don't weigh me down with having to read the Word and, and think about the Bible. So, you know, we kind of take those things apart. But listen, God never intended for these things to be separated. He never intended for us to separate spirit and truth. Truth divorced from spirit can lead us to a dead legalism. I got this this morning from, from Brother Steve. I'm about to use what you said this morning, Steve. Truth separated from spirit can lead to a dead legalism. Spirit separated from truth can lead to a wild fanaticism. They both need to be together. True worship embraces the truth of God's Word, and true worship also embraces the reality of God's presence. Aren't you thirsty for true worship? Man, I am. I think this is the greatest need of our, of our day. I think that's the greatest need of this country. You say, what's the greatest need of this country? Elections? New politicians? 
look, I'm praying for godly people. I understand politics are, are important, all that stuff. I'm kind of to the point, though, I think we're way beyond political solutions. I don't, think, I don't, I don't believe any of them anymore, you know. And, and what I think we need more than politics is revival. I think we need churches who are seeking the presence of God, submitting to God's truth, and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's what I'm thirsty for. Is that what you're thirsty for? Man, I'm hungry for that. I'm praying that God will raise up churches that will worship Him in spirit and truth. This Samaritan woman learned that meeting Jesus changes everything. It absolutely changed everything. And when you know Jesus, listen, you're qualified to receive Jesus. You're qualified to worship Jesus. But then listen to this. If you're not listening to anything else I've said tonight, please focus in on this point with me. Worshiping Jesus, meeting Jesus, means you are qualified to share Jesus. You are qualified to receive Jesus. You are qualified to worship Jesus. But you are qualified to share Jesus. Look at what this simple encounter did and how it changed this woman's life. Look at verse 27. At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. I tried to tell y'all that was a big deal a while ago, right? (laughs) She was amazed that Jesus was speaking to a Samaritan. The disciples were amazed that Jesus was speaking to a woman, right? So, They're amazed that he was speaking to a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? They learn better than to rebuke Jesus. That doesn't get you very far, does it? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and they were coming to him. I bet most of them were a little worried about the fact that this woman had said, hey, somebody's out here telling me everything I've ever done. They probably had vested interests, right? And so they're coming out to see what in the world is going on. And look at what happens. Look at what happens in verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. And look, this is all she said. This was her testimony. This is the essence of what it means to share Jesus. Right here, here's all you got to know. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking Him to stay with them, and He stayed there two days. Many more believed because of His word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That's the work of an evangelist right there. A successful evangelist will lead people to a point where they will say, you know what, I don't believe because of what you're saying anymore. Now I believe because I've met Jesus. That's, what, that's the whole go of sharing Jesus. Real worship will change your life. Real worship's contagious. One simple, unexpected encounter with Jesus, and this woman went from rejection to revival. She went from being an embarrassment to being an evangelist. She went from being an outcast on the edges of society to being the center of the spiritual life of this village. That's what Jesus can do with a life. That's what Jesus did this, with this woman. The people who once treated her like an outcast to be shunned now owe their very salvation to her testimony. Now listen, I just want to encourage you on something. If you have received Jesus like this woman, you are qualified to share Jesus. That's what you should learn from the woman at the well. She just simply goes and shares what Jesus had done for her. That's all she does. And it's effective. A whole village comes to Christ. But you know, many of us struggle with that, don't we? Many of us struggle with, are we qualified to share Jesus? Many of us struggle with, am I ready to do it? What if I start, try to share Jesus with somebody and, they, and I don't know the answer to a question they might ask? What if I try to share Jesus with somebody and I mess up all the facts? What if I share Jesus with somebody and I don't make sense? Anybody besides me struggle when it comes to sharing Jesus with somebody? Well, listen, let me just tell you. I 
have always thought that maybe one day I would become qualified enough that I wouldn't feel that way. I've worked hard at it. Listen, I have, have, have prepared myself as about as much as I know how. To, I don't know anything else I could do to try to become more qualified to share Jesus than what I've done. I mean, I've been trained in EE, you know. I've got a, a bachelor's degree from Union University in religion and Greek. I've got a Master of Divinity uh, degree from Beeson Divinity School uh, at Sanford University. I've got a Ph.D. in New Testament from Southern Seminary. I don't think there's another degree I can go get that I'm aware of uh, to try to become more qualified when it comes to sharing Jesus. I've got, had a lot of experience. You know, I've served at three of the most evangelistic churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. I served 10 years at Gardendale First Baptist Church. I served four years at Highview Baptist Church. I've been at Bellevue Baptist Church, the center of, of evangelism in the Southern Baptist Convention for the last seven years. I mean, I've been educated. I've been around, uh, been experienced. And let me let, let you in on a little secret. I still struggle with feeling qualified every time I feel like I need to share Jesus with somebody. You never get qualified enough to share Jesus. You never do. You never do. What if somebody asks me something that I don't know? Well, let me just share with you what I've learned. This is what I think is the key to, to being freed up so that you can share Jesus with somebody. Here's the key. Don't let what you don't know keep you from sharing what you do know. Don't let what you don't know keep you from sharing what you do know. I've learned three very powerful words that has helped me get over my fear of not being qualified when it comes to sharing Jesus. I'm going to share them with you right now. You ready? Here's my three words. Somebody starts to ask a question. I'm wanting to share Jesus with them. Somebody asks me a question that I don't know the answer to. Here's the three words that will get you out every time. You ready? I don't know. I don't know. Let's just say those three words together. I just want you to say them with me, and, and, and then we're going to see the roof will not fall in. Are you ready? Let's say them together. One, two, three. I don't know. Woo, we're going to get free in here tonight. It's all right. You don't have to know everything to share Jesus with somebody. You don't have to know everything. You say, Brother Russ, how old is the earth? I don't know. You say, Brother Russ, how does the sovereignty of God and the free will of man work together? I don't know. You say, Brother Russ, why does God let bad things happen to good people? I don't know. You say, Brother Russ, are you a Calvinist? How many points? Are you an Arminian? Are you an Amarillian? Are you a dispensationalist? Are you a superlapsarian or infralapsarian? Are you a charismatic? Are you a cessationist? Are you a dispensationalist? I don't know. But let me tell you what I do know. <laughs> what I do know is that every time I've tried to live my life in my own power, I've messed it up. I know that I'm guilty before a holy God of sin and that I should deserve punishment for all my sins. I know that I am naked before Him in guilt and shame. And I know that before I met Jesus, my life was a mess. And I know that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And He lived a sinless life. Yet He was tempted in all things. And He taught us to love God. And He taught us to love each other. And He healed people. And He performed miracles. And He healed the blind. And He raised dead people to life. And I know that this Jesus died a real death on a cross and he paid the penalty and he took our punishment and I know that this Jesus paid for my sins and I know this Jesus paid for your sins and I know this Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive he's alive and I 
know this. Jesus is coming back again one day. And he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth. That's what I know. I know he can change my life. And I know he can change your life. And most of all, most of all, like this Samaritan woman, I know that I've met a man who told me everything I've ever done. And I was, I was exposed. And I was afraid. And I didn't have anywhere to run. And I didn't have anywhere to hide. And I couldn't fool him. And I couldn't act like something I wasn't. I was completely, completely exposed before him. And he loved me. <laughs> and he loved me. And he loved me. And he offered me the gift of God. And he offered to satisfy my thirst. That's what I know. And that's what you know. You know, you've got a Ph.D. in what Jesus has done for you. You might not know the answer to every question, but you know what Jesus has done for you. And that's all you really have to share. If you can, if you can share that, you are qualified. You are qualified. You're qualified to receive Jesus. You're qualified to worship Jesus. And you're qualified to share Jesus.